So thank you for reaching out. I'm excited to hear what questions you have. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no formalities. Like I said, just go ahead and ask yeah, away. I do have a few questions. And the first, of course, because I saw your blogs about the um, like suggestions for the application document preparation. So I do have question about the personal statements. Yeah. Um, because generally, like people will start with a very like kind of boring um personal statement that just uh, illustrate how their life will be was like in the past. Um, but you mentioned that we can make our PS more like innovative, like more vivid to professors. I just wonder how you made that. Yeah, so I think um, I, I probably do mention this somewhere in my blog, but in general, my advice to people is that the personal statement for the PhD programs, that's you're applying to PhD programs, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, they don't need to be like, I feel like when you're writing a essay for undergraduate, school um, admission it has to be this like super creative story where you're like making people cry and like really or like for medical school I it, you know like I feel like those personal statements need to really hit like the heartstrings you know for a PhD okay. application you don't need to do that um, okay. they just care about your research experience and you being able to explain that research experience well and elaborate on those experiences and be able to explain that clearly. But in terms of the story element, I think that it's not necessary at all. But if you have a little bit of it, it just makes mm -hmm. your personal statement stand out. Okay. I think that 90% of the personal statement should just almost be like a really like detailed version of the best moments of your research experience. Mm -hmm. Um and then you weave in a little bit, like 10% of it is like a little story or like some okay. kind of theme or something about you more personally to make it sound less dry. And that's about it. So that's okay. kind of how I would recommend you approaching the personal statement. And I say this to everyone. Um, I'm saying it now on, you know, to you and to everyone, but um, you are more than welcome to, after you draft your first um version yourself, I'm more than happy to send my um, personal statement to you. Um, I only ask that you draft it first because um, I don't want you to look at my personal statement and then want to copy it uh, or feel like it needs to look like my story because everyone's story is unique and different. But once you draft yours, I'm happy to send you mine and also provide um, some high level comments back on your personal statement if you want me to take a look at yours and just provide a little feedback. I'd be happy to do that. Yes, yes, that will be awesome. Yeah, yes, definitely, because I'm also having yeah. my first draft over PS. And when I look at, oh, it's just yeah. like normal, it's good, but not great. As <laughs> No, I'm sure it's great. And um, <laughs> there's always, it's always nice to have other people read it because then they can give you their sort of like, because when you're looking at your personal statement, you start, you sometimes get lost because you're just, you're, you just keep looking at the same thing. And sometimes a yeah. fresh pair of eyes really helps just give you like even a couple nuggets of stuff to help it go from being great to amazing, you know? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would just say like the easiest way to kind of incorporate that story is just, I would say bookend your personal statement with that. So like, maybe talk about something a little bit personal at the beginning, then go into your research experience and then weave it all back at the end. And then that can be a good way of figuring out how to like put the more personal touch into your statement. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. And I wonder what's your general working hour? Um, I don't want to like disturb you during the weekends or at night when you have some leisure time. So, oh, you can just send it to me whenever. And then I'll just get, I, I work all around the clock, um, <laughs> at whatever's convenient for me. Um, so, but mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, don't worry. Um, don't, like I said, no formalities, just like send things to me and then I'll, um, I'll work on them when I can. And yeah, sometimes, sometimes I like to do work on the weekend mornings mm -hmm. and then, but then like on a Friday afternoon, I just won't do any, like, you know, so yeah, my schedule is yeah. very flexible. Um, so don't worry about like good times to contact me. You can contact me whenever. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Then jump to our second question. Yeah. I really, um, I don't have much trouble with the application, um, the application document because it is there. I cannot do more thing about it. 
but I really have the issue of identifying supervisor for a PhD yeah. program. I reach out to some professors, mm -hmm. um, but you know, very few of them replied. Mm -hmm. I just wonder what's the strategy of getting a professor interested in you? Yeah. So did you take a look at my template that I have on my blog? Um, yes. So yeah, use my template word for word, just copy and paste it and then fill in that blank with your own research experience. Um, attach your CV. And then I would just, if you don't hear from them in like 10 business days or about two weeks, I would say that's okay to nudge. So I wonder uh, at, when you apply for the program, how many professors have you contacts with? Yeah. So all you need is one good conversation at each program you're applying to. So don't feel like you need to talk to everyone in that department. Um, start with one. And usually if that one conversation goes really well and they want you to talk to more people, then talk to more people, but a lot that goes into it. So my recommendation is always to apply to as many schools as you can. And mm -hmm. at each of those schools that you apply to, try to connect with at least one professor. And the more schools that you do that with and the more you apply to, the higher your chances will be of getting into at least one of those programs. So I would say somewhere between five to 10 schools is probably a good number. Yeah. Okay. I tell people this all the time. You need to consider your personal life in like, mm -hmm. it's not just going to the best school or the best, whatever, like you should consider the location, like your family, like the people around you, because, you know, in like, you're going to be at this place for four plus years. And it's not just about like, you know, what the school has to offer within itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. If I got any uh, meetings with professor, how, what should I talk about during that meeting and how to capture their eyes? Yeah. Well, first off, I want to say you're not too late. It's only the end of September. This is when I started my outreach when I was applying and mm -hmm. it, some people like to think that the earlier you talk to people, the better, but I don't necessarily think that's true. I think as long as you have the conversation sometime, um, mm -hmm. Ideally, before you submit the application, but even after, you know, I think that as long as you try to make the connection, um, it's okay. And if you end up not talking to anyone at that program you're applying to, you can still apply to the program mm -hmm. and mention that you want to work with that professor. Just you can't say that you had a conversation with them in your personal statement or your application. Okay, what was your question again? Sorry, I like went off on um, that. Well, oh, yeah, how to what to talk to um, professors about on the course. Right. So, there's a whole section on my blog that does outline kind of a, I think it's the next one, the networking with professors um, tab on my blog. Yes. I will yeah. So on there, it outlines kind of my recommendation, um, but prepare to talk about yourself and your interest. Mm -hmm. But I would also let the other professor chat about their research because people in yeah, academia, yeah. love talking about their own work. I love talking about my own work. So you'll be surprised that like, you might get on the call to, and be kind of anxious. Like, oh no, they're going to ask me a bunch of questions, but no, they're going to just be talking and being excited about their research. And then you kind of then chime in and be like, okay, well you have a project on this. Like I'm working on this right now, which is really similar. And I would love to help you like, mm -hmm. and so you try to tie yourself to the things that they share about what's going on. And obviously, if the conversation is going really well, you can ask them at the end, like, you know, how is the PhD program? Do you work with students? Do they like the program? Are you taking students? Would you take me mm -hmm. as like a mentee? I would love, you sound like a great mentor, like, you know, really talk that part up. And at the end, usually if the conversation goes well, they'll like say, yeah, like, I'd love to work with you. Put me down in your personal statement or your application. And I'm excited. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> That's generally like I... um. Like, I would say that I didn't have a single call that didn't go well. The only times that it did were when they were like, oh, you know, I do more like adult, you know, tobacco research where you do more like adolescent prevention research. Mm -hmm. uh, but that person still ended up taking me as like, or accepting me into their program as a mentee. So I don't really know. So clearly like that didn't matter, um, but 
Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, mostly for the most part, the calls go really well. And it's, it's, it's like an exciting call because you're both coming together to talk about something that you're both mutually interested in. So um, yeah, that sounds intriguing. Huh? Yeah. And I just wonder if you or the professor and you were like meeting with those students during their application process, and what quality will you measure uh, that value most? Um, you think like, is your question like, what, what do you think that they're looking for in applicants? Yeah. Honestly, like I always say that, like, I think it's, it's so subjective based mm -hmm. on that year, that school, who reads your application, who else is applying. Like I've seen people at Harvard, like some of my colleagues, some of my friends who are perfect applicants mm -hmm. and they don't get in. So sometimes it's just luck, which <laughs> I think it's actually more luck than it is like a checklist of this is what they're looking for. Um, mm -hmm. But if I were to try to say like, what are they looking for? I think they're looking for people who are, have strong research experience, but also strong research passion. And mm -hmm. like that passion has to sort of like match what the department is sort of like their, the direction that they're kind of going in. Um, okay. But, but that, that's also very vague. I understand. But I think just like highlighting your strong research experience is going to mm -hmm. be the only, it's going to be the best thing that you can do to actually like control, like that you can, control, right. you know, like you can, you can't control like who reads your application and the luck based part of the process, but you can control how much you lift up certain parts of your experience like you very detailed and specific about that journey, your passion, why you did that. And that's the story that's going to get you through. Yeah. Um, okay. And you highlight your couple of publications and that only adds, you know, a little extra sparkle to your application. So okay. I think you're in really good shape. Going back to the other question you asked, I think one thing that programs do sort of look for or I think it helps your application at least is when you talk about your story and it's interesting, like you didn't just go straight from undergrad to master's to PhD, like straight and didn't do anything else. Like you kind of had, you explored a little and you did other things to kind of get you to where you are now. I think that mm -hmm. is really helpful when you are applying. So just know that that's a good thing. And like I said, I can help you you know, when you write your personal statement, just make sure that you highlight that and make it stand out. That sounds awesome. Thank you yeah. so much. I definitely need to send my PS to you. Yeah, <laughs> no rush. You have plenty of time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Mm. And I wonder, although, yeah, you have many rec records about your PhD live, but I still want to ask in person that how you feel about your PhD life. Do you have a work life life balance? And what's what what is the part that you enjoy most? Oh, this is such a great question. And I think <laughs> that um it's not asked enough. And like I definitely think work life balance is so important. And that was something that I held on to really, really tightly when I was a PhD student. Um, I think it is really easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day, like stress, especially the first two years at any program, mm -hmm. you're just thrown a bunch of courses, et cetera. Like it's a lot of homework. It's a lot of exams. You're taking a lot of classes. You're doing your, um, all of your qualifying exams. So it is very overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. but I, for me, no matter what, every day I like still went to my yoga class. I mm -hmm. would schedule everything around that. I would relax at the end of the day and watch TV. I would do the things that I would need to do. I would still, I made friends and I would hang out with those friends and study with those friends. That was what my first couple of years were like. I, I did everything I could to, balance my life and be really <laughs> your grades don't matter in your PhD program at all. It's like, you're done. Like you're not going to anything after that. So you just have to pass your classes. And for me, I was like, okay, I just want to do enough to pass my classes. And then all the leftover time, I'm going to relax and have fun and like recover so I can 
do the work when I need to do the work. And then after the after the first two years of coursework, I, I also, like COVID happened during my PhD. So that was like oh. very weird um, too. Um, but after my first, after the coursework mostly was out of the way, then I was like, oh my God, it was like night and day. I loved that I had, I could build my own schedule. I just do the work when I want to. Um, mm-hmm. And I figured out like what times of day, like my brain works best. And I would just work during those hours and relax during the hours that I wanted to. And it wasn't your standard nine to five. Um, but as an academic, as a student, you can do that. So um, that worked really well for me. And then I feel like I have so much free time to like, like today, mm-hmm. like I'm after this is my like my last sort of like call um, this Friday afternoon. And then I'm going to go spend the rest of the day with my family and um, celebrate the mid autumn festival. And that's something that I, you know, can do, you know, it's not even one o'clock yet and I'm going to call it a day and that's okay. You know, mm-hmm. but that's yeah. also because like, you know, I got up at 8 a.m. this morning and started working on a paper. So like there's, there's, but that's how my brain works well. Like I have certain hours of the day where I know I work best and then I take breaks when I need to. And I am very happy. Um, yeah. That's someone so actually said this to me uh, when I was on, I ran into one of my students um, that I was teeing an undergrad oh. student at Harvard. We were, we ran into each other on the bus. So we just like sat together and we're talking Um, and she said this to me and she was like, she was a senior, a graduating senior at Harvard at undergrad college. And she looked at me and she's like, Jessica, you are the happiest grad student I have ever met in my entire life. And that's saying (laughs) because I'm a senior, I've taken so many classes and have so many TAs. Like I've never met anyone like you who just is, seems so kind of like happy with their PhD experience. And Mm -hmm. um, so I do feel like, and I think that's why I like write blogs and make videos and do all this stuff because I have really enjoyed it. Um, I am not going to say, like, I think some people, this PhD experience can be really stressful. Um, I had a lot of luck and I had good mentors, good experiences, made friends, like had family to support me, had a partner to support me. So I feel very lucky um, that I was able to have like a pretty smooth and happy PhD experience. But I think that there is a lot that you can do to control that yourself and just make sure that you keep your, you don't just let work eat everything up and you still just carve out time to do the things that make you happy and to rest and for me that was watching yeah that's really something very special about you yes really something special in you that i saw your videos and your blogs and feel oh my gosh she's a phd and then she can also do these things she can manage time very well because I also reach out to other PhD students, but you know, very few of them reply to even to my email and, and oh, they just that's... ignore that. I guess they're just like, so busy. But yeah, you have the time for all the things for mentoring students, for TA, and for blog and for videos. I really appreciate that. That makes yeah. the PhD life really sounds kind of promising oh, it is and I it's it's really what you make of it you know mm-hmm. and I, it's I think it's really easy to get caught up in how busy things get how hard the courses are how much homework you have all the exams it is really mm-hmm. easy and I think I I've just learned how to really compartmentalize stuff I'm like okay like there are just going to be times where I'm going to be really unhappy and really frustrated there's going to be stuff that is not working the way I want it and like you have to be able to separate that from your life and still Mm -hmm. be because your life isn't just about the PhD program like you said you have a partner you probably like you know want to go do fun things and like you have hobbies and you have other stuff outside of that and life is not just about you know your career I totally agree yeah like I, I, I've, I've really strongly held on to that as hard as it can be sometimes. And I think that's why I've stayed this kind of positive and happy. And so mm-hmm. I'm really happy you reached out and I'm totally, do you have any other questions by the way? Um, uh, for, uh, sorry, pardon. Do you have other questions for me? Um, yeah. Was- yeah. I just wonder how you balance your research and teaching and study. Yeah. Because you mentioned that first the two year will be really stressful. Yeah. I mean, like I, 
this is kind of like the way that I answered your last question. It's just, you will figure it out. There's no kind of like magic Mm -hmm. answer for that either. You have to get your work done. Like you have to turn your assignments in, you have to study for your exams. But I think that you just need to one, figure out the times of day, like I said, that work best for you um, in terms of getting things done and kind of your working style. And two, do not let go of your hobbies and things that help you like stay happy and like take care of your body and spending time with the people you love. Like do not let that part go. And I think that's what helps I have a lot of like, I'm like an insane scheduler. Like I have to do, I have like 10 to-do lists that are all really organized and like I calendar everything. That's my technique. And you'll figure mm-hmm. out your own personal sort of like organization. But I do think that okay. there, it requires some calendaring and to-do lists, like some form of extra level of kind of planning ahead, writing things down, like organizing Um, and I don't want to, we can have like another larger conversation about that. That's like a whole different thing of like organization techniques, but I definitely think adopting like a planner or like something like that is definitely necessary. And then sticking to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, because like you're studying in Harvard, which is a big tech, uh, like tech institution. I wonder if you have um, like pressure, like publishing papers, doing research, no, I mean, honestly, <laughs> no one ever told me like you have to publish. If anything, okay. it was like my first two years, I feel like I was so hungry to do more research. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the professors were like, don't focus on your courses. Don't worry. Like you'll publish eventually. And I was like, no, I want to like get started now. Um, so no, I never felt that pressure. If anything, I had to go find it myself. And that's why I stayed really prolific in grad school is because I went out and like made other connections with other professors outside of my department um, and did papers with them. So Mm -hmm. that way I always kind of had like a constant pipeline of like, I was working on a bunch of different projects and they weren't all necessarily tied to like my exact program. Okay. That sounds awesome because I'm kind of worried about that, about the pressure of publishing. Oh, no, no, no one is, the pressure is never really going to come from the program it's mm-hmm. more going to be just like, you know, you should publish for your own good, but that's, mm-hmm. I've never felt like there was like a person telling me that I had to do that. It's more of the like overall being a PhD student kind of pressure, but not, my advisor was never like, you're not publishing enough. You know, I've no one <laughs> ever said that to me. So Okay. That's great to know. And just one a final question like among your I know you're currently the postdoc at Stanford and among your peers uh is there any other career outcomes yeah um besides being a postdoc Mm -hmm. yeah I mean that's like the most common next step because it's just like it gives you more time to breathe and train and like work on stuff get more publications um you get paid a little bit more which is nice um but if you don't want to go into academia, um, I have friends who went into consulting and are very happy with that decision and very happy. Other people who are working um, for like, you know, big medical companies, um, both nonprofit and for profit. Um, I'm trying to think of what else people are doing. Everyone that I know who graduated is like very happy. A lot of them are doing postdocs at different places and you can do a postdoc and then not go into academia. That's also very okay. okay. Um, the postdoc is just kind of like a next step. And then from there, you can still apply to non-academic jobs too. Um, okay. But I would say that's what most people do. They do the postdoc and then after that, they decide academia, industry, or people go straight and they do consulting or work for nonprofit. Like, I think some people will go work for like, um, like research companies like RTI or RAND, um, which are non-academic, mm-hmm. but still do research and have mm-hmm. similar promotion structures. Yeah. So there's oh. lots of options. I think at the end of the day, and this is, my parents actually said this to me and my parents are like not educated at all. Like they, um, so, but they always say to me like, you know, no matter what, even if you don't 
become a professor like your you know end goal is um you'll always have your phd and that is something that sets you apart from so many people like i forget yeah. what it is but it's like if you get a phd you're in like the one percent of like people in the u.s who have a top degree and like that will take you so far even if you don't go the traditional sort of like postdoc whatever whatever route mm -hmm. so you'll always have your phd um no matter what you end up doing um and that will open a lot of doors for you yeah that's really intriguing thanks to your parents <laughs> i agree <laughs> yeah okay i think i have to take too much time oh no um, this is really great i um you sound like you know you're in good shape like you're doing all the right things to apply mm -hmm. um like i said send me your personal statement whenever you're ready we can that can be the next thing that we do and i'm really happy to now that you've reached out to me you're stuck with me so i'm going to you know want to know about your journey and um hear about how the um application is going and like i said i'm totally here for any questions big or small that would be terrific thank you so yeah. much jessica this is so helpful yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm so, not sure life will your uh, YouTube and you see how your postdoc life will be. And yeah, you should. I have some good video. Well, um, all right. Thank well you. any final questions before we wrap up? Oh, I just have my final question. <laughs> oh, sorry. I just asked you my final question about okay. the outcome. Okay. So, no, you don't have any other questions? Mm, not for not at this moment. Okay. Well, you know, you can always reach out. I'm always happy to help. I know things will probably come up, um, but I'm so excited for you. I'm um, you, you asked like such great questions. And I, I love that you are thinking already about balance and life and all of that with the PhD. So um, I think you're really making the right, you know, you, you seem very <laughs> prepared. You're doing all the right things. Um, I know it's like a big process mm -hmm. um, and I'm here to help you as much as I can. So um, just Thank let you. me know. Good luck. Happy Thank Autumn you. Festival. You. Enjoy your mooncakes, your Rito twos tonight. Yeah. And um, yeah, I will hopefully hear from you again. And thank you so yeah. much for reaching out. And thank you for your time expertise. Oh, of course. Anytime. All right. Bye. Bye.